Autism rates continue to rise. We know that early identification and intervention is very important to maximize the potential for a person with autism. Now, there are two major studies that were just released that looks at a video tool in order to help identify children in a much easier and faster way than the current standard of care. So let's talk about it. Hey everybody, it's Dr. David. So you may know that one of my areas of interest of passion for the past 25 years has been working with children with autism. Now, as a functional medicine doctor, most people are coming to me because they have a child with a diagnosis of autism and they are looking for things to help them out. Different types of nutritional interventions, detoxification interventions, ways of helping sleep, GI problems, etc. Okay. Now, also, I am a primary care pediatrician and in our office, we see kids from birth on and part of the standard of care is to screen for autism. And so that's, of course, something that we do. But right now, we are seeing incidents of autism in one in 36 children, and the rate has kept on rising. And as I've shared on this channel before, 25 years ago, when I first start, when I first became a pediatrician, that number was one in 500. And there's clearly better identification. Now, earlier interventions, certain labels, you know, especially higher functioning people with autism may not have been given an autism diagnosis previously. So there is, because of awareness, evaluation, re-understanding the condition, there's an increase. But again, one in 36, um, that's just an amazingly high number and sad and scary. Okay. Now, as I had mentioned, when the earlier that we can identif uh, identify a problem, the faster we can intervene. We know that there are behavioral therapies, educational therapies, speech therapies. The sooner you get them started, the more likely you have a child ready to go in a less restricted, potentially even normal mainstream kindergarten class and for early and for that early education. So we really, really want to focus on getting this figured out and treated as much as possible. And of course, if there are detoxification issues, nutritional issues, etc., correcting them as soon as possible because that obviously the gut brain connection, we obviously want to make sure that we're feeding the brain properly. We're avoiding all toxins as much as possible too. Now, the current way that pediatricians check for as a screen for autism is called an MCHAT. This is the name of the diagnostic tool. It's a questionnaire. Um, I believe there's 16 questions to it. Actually, I think it's a little more, 18, but it typically, you, you can ask the questions starting at 16 months, as late as 30 months, and it will say whether a child is at low, medium, or high risk for autism. It's not a diagnostic tool. It's a screening tool. And if somebody's positive, then they will typically go on and get a more um, full developmental evaluation performed typically by a psychologist in order to really assess whether um, the child, how likely that they can really, or if they do have autism. Okay, so it's a multi-step process. Now, um, often though, it takes two years between when a parent thinks that there's something wrong and when they get an actual diagnosis. So it's around two years that um, people start to realize that there's an issue, but it could be, it's on average four years old before a diagnosis is made. And I've seen so many patients who have come to me with kids with autism, whose pediatrician says, ah, he's just a late bloomer. Oh, everything's okay. Despite the fact that the kid's not speaking any words at two years of age. And then, and time goes on. And then eventually the doctor will say, okay, I guess you need to, we need to do this. Now, again, pediatricians are now being taught more. Don't wait. Don't blow this off. It's better to over-evaluate than to undervaluate. But part of the problem lies, it's hard to get in with somebody. It's hard to get in with the psychologist, a test that takes four hours on average in order to do. So um, that becomes a problem too because of access, right? Um, availability to, to do those things. And there's costs in it, involved as well. Um, that, that could be a problem. Um, now, in comes this new test that I'm refer that I started talking about. Okay, and the name of the test is called the Early Point Evaluation, and it's actually was last year FDA approved. Now it's not something that is commercially available now, but the researchers are really starting to look at it now, and and they're getting some pretty good evidence out of this. Now, what they're doing, so as I said, normally a full psychological evaluation takes four hours to do. Um, and this test, this early point test that I'm talking about, it takes eight to 12 minutes. And within 15 minutes, you have a result. Okay. Whereas with the other, there's a lot of scoring that has to come. You can't, you don't get an answer right off of the bat. You have to do the, the psychologist has to spend a lot of time afterwards scoring it all up in order to write a report, but this is happening much, much faster. OK, now what this is actually doing is that the the child is watching a video 
of other kids inter, um, interacting with each other and other types of things that would be getting the normal stimulation of the eyes. And they're a part of the device is it's recording at 120 um, recordings per second, everything that the eyes are doing. And then they compare what the what that child has to a standard norm of lots and lots of other kids to figure out what the averages should be. OK, and so, again, quite easy because let's face it, a lot of kids, even if they're having lower functioning issues, um, they're all screen time addicted. So it's kind of easy to get them to do this. And I, I shouldn't say that jokingly because obviously screen time is a huge issue in our country that was only exacerbated by lockdowns and such like that, where kids spend all of their time on screen. So, uh, yeah, not a not a wonderful situation there. Um, so basically, so I'm going to talk now about these two studies. OK, and I want to give you some basic definitions first because you'll you'll understand the science that I'm talking about. So in science, one of the ways that we are recording information in when, when research is done in order for are called specificity and sensitivity. Now specificity is how likely is a negative result of the test accurate. Okay. So is is a negative really negative? Okay. Sensitivity is how likely is a positive test to really be positive. Okay, so sensitivity, specificity. So in the first study that was done, now it actually turns out that there were um, the, these re there was two studies, two different sets of individuals in terms of the subjects. It's the same um, research group that actually did both of these. And so there were six um, nationally recognized university-based autism spectrum disorder clinics. Um, the primary authors were out of Health Atlanta, Emory University, but also Seattle Children's Hospital, Cleveland Children's Hospital. A lot of really major um, centers were involved in, in the data collecting of this. And in this first study, which was a double-blinded placebo-controlled study um, of 475 children. And so what they did is they measured what was called social visual engagement. Okay, which we know people with autism, that's one of the earliest things that's done. A, 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 a family member, a mother, will, a father will say, my kid's not making eye contact the way that they're supposed to, or not being stimulated, or not looking at things that I'm pointing at, you know, things that I'm trying to point out. There seems to be some type of engagement that's missing there, okay? And what they found is that on this, that the when, when this test was run, the sensitivity was 71% and 80% relative to doing the um relative to doing that more long term it was called an ADOS test um which is the autism diagnosis observation schedule so the sensitivity of 71% the specificity of 87% now they also took a subgrid of subset of kids these are kids who already had a diagnosis of autism so those first sets of kids they did both the ADOS and the the test and they saw how they correlated but the subset of group of kids were kids who had the diagnosis already so they could see, hey, how does this thing score against a kid you know about? OK, and what they found here is that the sensitivity here was 78 percent and the specificity was 85 percent, 84, 85 percent. And those are really good numbers for tests. It would be great if they were 100 percent, 95 percent. Very few interventions or tests are. OK, now the same study, I mean, this, the same group, as I said, in their second study. They looked, it was again double blinded, um, placebo controlled. There were 1,089 um, individual children. They were all aged 16 to, up to 30. Um, and of this, 17, 719 of them, it was part of the discovery. Do they have autism? And 370 were replicating it. So, kind of like what I was talking about before. What they found here on this larger st um, study was that the sensitivity was 82%. And the specificity was 90%, 89.9%. And that's for the discovery. They then found for the um, the sensitivity, for those who knew it already, it was 80% um, um, with specificity then being 82%. So again, these are highly sensitive, um, highly um, statistically um, important numbers. And that's the, the way I have to say it. So now the interesting thing is that when one therapist one psychologist does the evaluation um, using that ADOS, it still felt to be that a sensitive, the sensitivity and specificity are between 80 to 90%. And I've clearly seen a child be seen by more than one either developmental pediatrician, they do these tests also, or psychologists, where I've seen the reports and they're kind of different. Okay. And of course, a kid could have a bad day, a good day. How did they eat? How did they sleep the night before? Or just whatever, because, you know, we, we know that kids with autism can just have good and bad days. So, of course, that takes into account. 
um, as well. So even the even the standard test is not really considered more sensitive and specific than than what these uh, visual tests are. Okay. Now the author of the lead, one of the lead authors of the study also showed, but it wasn't. Um, they they commented in an interview afterwards, but they didn't present this data. So of course we need to see it. Um, that there was also. Um, the test can provide information about child social um, disabilities, um, verbal abilities, um, nonverbal learning abilities, and information that can help guide the treatment plan. And that is super important too, right? Because it's one thing to say, you got this diagnosis. It's another thing to be able to create a plan that would be the best action plan to help that individual child out. And that's key. OK, so as I said, this is something that is not commercially available yet. Um, it's it's available in, in these in these places. But, you know, it's going to there's going to be probably some more studies that need to be done in order to like really clinically validate that this this will be something. But, you know, hopefully this will be something that we'll be able to have in our offices. Parents don't need to buy it because you only do it once. Um, but something that hopefully if that if they are able to replicate it in larger studies, that this could be something potentially in every um, pediatrician's office and then we can have a lot more information a lot more fast so i'll be looking out for it but in the meantime have a good day